Constructing your life is about much more than just building a bank account. Each week, join real estate entrepreneur and mindset coach Austin Linney as he interviews guests who are constructing their dream lives and impacting the world around them on a daily basis. If you're an entrepreneur or wanting to start a business, or you just want to hear motivating stories of how others have overcome the odds, you are in the right place. And now for your host, Austin Linney. Guys, welcome back to Construct Your Life. This is Austin Linney here, and I have Whitney in the house. How are you doing, Whitney? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having me on. There's a lot of people I love in this world, and Mandy is like, I put her like up there, you know? So like anytime she sends me anybody, I'm like, we literally might have the same brain. So like, I'm like, she knows exactly where I vibe. So, uh, you know, Mandy introduces, so I'm so excited yeah, uh, you know, I was reading over your resume. We were talking about before, you know, very accomplished real estate investor. Uh, but you said something, you said, but it's been really great to mountain bike in Arkansas and be a mom. And so, like, I love that because, you know, a lot of times in business, we get involved in too much business. <laughs> it's really as simple as it is, right? And we think that that's going to make, you know, make us feel and, and you have to work the line, like you were saying, but, you know, do you want to start your story where you'd like to, and we'll kind of go from there and see where, where we go. Yeah, definitely. Well, so I actually now currently I'm the director of investor education at passiveinvesting.com. Um, we are a private equity firm focused on multifamily. Um, oh, I should say passive cash flowing assets with that build generational wealth, multifamily car washes, self storage. However, that is not where I started. I didn't wake up one day like in this world. Um, I started off in 2002. Um, you know, I had no intentions of buying a house. My significant other wanted to buy a house and, um, he didn't have the job or the income to do it. I did. I'm like, okay, you know, we'll do this a little out of order, you know, we'll get the house now and you know, figure everything else out later. Well, relationship fell apart pretty quickly after we closed on the property. And here I had a property that I didn't intend on having. And I feel, I felt like I couldn't afford. I mean, this is in 2006, the wild, wild west of lending. I was 103% financed with zero of my own money in the deal. <laughs> I could fog a mirror. That was about it. Right. And um, anyways, I, st- I was like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? I stuffed it full of roommates to pay the bills. And then I started um, rehabbing the house. I mean, it needed a lot of love, paid a lot of friends and sushi and pizza and beer and got the property all um, fixed up and sold it 11 months later. I thought I had to get out from underneath it. And when I sold the property, I walked with $52,000 in my pocket. And then I was like, I haven't pay, been paying for anything, no utilities, no housing for 11 months. I'm like, ooh, how many more of these can I do? And not every day it'll win as, as well as, you know, you might think not as well as that one, but you know, I took my lumps and I figured some things out. And um, later, a few years later, I met my husband and we continued doing the fix and flipping. And then um, we're just gonna figure out how to like retire off of real estate and, and unlock those golden handcuffs or even just like loosen them a little bit. And so um, we were we kind of slapped ourselves in the head when somebody told us, you should hold on to all those flips you're doing and rent them out. We're like, oh, genius idea. <laughs> As we were living in a rental at the time when we were given that advice. I'm like, oh, that's how it's done. So like, I'm, I'm a very driven person. I, you know, I get shown a shy, a, like an idea that works. I like went full for, force, um, mm-hmm. bought 30 properties within about two, a little over two years. A large portion of them, we did a rehab on them. The first 10 were turnkey. And then I figured out how to, to combine our flipping skills with um, the, the out-of-state investment skills. And uh, yeah, we were able to you know, get a lot of our capital back. And so um, we started loosening this, uh, those golden handcuffs. But when you scale like that, you know, get 30 single family properties under your belt, even if there's property management, you don't have your time back. And I know that's something we wanted to talk about today is like the five freedoms that, you know, that people are pursuing in their life. 
And that's when I was introduced to the concept of passive investing, where it's kind of like the larger deals, like multifamily deals, car wash deals, soft storage deals, but turnkey. And, and there's, there's, it's not as simple as that. I mean, there's a lot of nuances to that. You have to, you know, now you're not vetting a property, but you're vetting a business. But I really dove in head first in that arena. And uh, it's been a wonderful ride. We, we still have active properties. We have long-term rentals. We have short-term rentals. You know, we have our pri- uh, primary investment though are the passive investments. Mm-hmm. When, do you think that everybody has to kind of walk that line of like graduating up to the properties? Like when you look back at your career, do you, do you, do you cherish kind of the, the steps that you took or, or, you know, is that kind of the quintessential real estate journey for most people? So there's a little bit of untangling there, right? It's, I think it's a real estate, a common real estate journey for a lot of investors that want to scale a portfolio, scale to get their time back, right? Scale to have freedom of location, independence, freedom of choice, financial freedom. Um, Now, I think, do you have to start with buying a single family property? No, I don't think so. Mm-hmm. I don't I don't believe that at all. I think it's an easy for for a for people to get into real mm-hmm. estate. It's something that's very tangible. Once you figure out how to buy your primary, you're you're essentially reapplying the same skills to get like that next property. Um, but it's certainly not where um, you know, if somebody uh, you know needs to start there because of capital uh, or fear or just hesitations in general, that's a great place to start. But, you know, for somebody who is just, you know, maybe like in a higher, you know, paying job or has the, the, the capital free, you can maybe skip some of those steps. But I I walk people through this process, investors through this process when I'm working with them. And number one, the first obstacle is you have to believe in real estate, right? And that is the first thing we're trying to solve. And I think that's how a lot of people get into single family real estate is that they believe in it because they live in their own house, but they don't believe in it as an asset class that can actually produce income from them. You know, generate the four wealth builders, you know, capital preservation, cash flow, appreciation. Um, and then you start unlocking the beautiful tax benefits that come with real estate. And you can do that too with your primary guys. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. but like, you know, with depreciation in 1031, like with your investment properties, you know, that's, that's a, you know, an extra layer on there. It's just, it's so, you know, we're, we have a meeting next week to structure our multiple businesses through a tax attorney. And like the first call, I'm like, Bro, I know what you're saying right now. Like, you know, he's been in the game a long time. And like, I knew we were in the right place. Like, if you're telling me stuff that I don't know, like, I know that you're the guy. But it's alarming to me. You know, it's so funny that you say that. I mean, I've talked, I've done 500 episodes and nobody's ever said you have to believe in real estate. Like, you have to understand it outside of like, I live in walls, like there's a vehicle. And like, I know that in Airbnb. But like, I think back to when I started, like, you're kind of just like bumming around like, oh my God, like we, you know, it's like so funny that somebody mentioned to you like, hey, you know, why don't you hold him? Like, and like, seriously, like you're, you're saying it like I had to like, it had to hit the hit for me. Like, and, and it's really that it starts off back at that belief of like, this is a vehicle that can get me to where I need to go done yeah. the right way. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, for us, you know, when or you know, I will speak for myself when I was initially doing what what is now called live in flipping and house hacking, I was combining the two strategies. I, I mean, I had cash flow coming in, the properties were appreciating. I didn't know how to take advantage of the tax benefits. I was missing one of those wealth builders. Uh, and I, I mean, I should say I had a little bit of cash flow coming in to cover my expenses, but I wasn't able to like experience bringing in 300, 400, 500, or even like on my short-term rentals, the thousand or 1500 or 2,500 a month Mm -hmm. on those properties. So, um, you know, really, you know, that's where I, I was seeking out investment strategies that, you know, could give me all of those wealth pillars at once. And it was as simple as just being able to hold on to the property and put a tenant in the property. It just, Mm -hmm. it was, it was almost like Occam's razor, right? The simplest explanation is sometimes the the, the most correct one. Mm-hmm. When you when you took the step and you got into the passive income and the bigger deals, what was what was easier than you thought standing in front of it, and what was harder than you thought when you got started? Well, so um, let me back it up a little bit and kind of tell you like the 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 ceiling that I hit. Well, yeah. so I was sitting there one day. We had thirty single family properties. 
Um, you know, I had figured out all the different lending pieces with commercial. So I, I had kind of cracked through that, that little bit of a glass ceiling, but I had a little child at home. I had a little daughter and I also was taking care of two. I was guardians over my grandparents, my, my mom's parents. And my mom had, you know, uh, was ailing too. And so I'm like, I'm working full time. I'm burning the candle at two, both ends, five times in the middle. And I was just, I looked at my properties. I'm like, Hey, the whole point of this was for us to be able to loosen these golden handcuffs, offset our retirement. What if we started, you know, harvesting some of this cash flow right now in order to kind of free up our life a little bit so I can put my time and attention, most importantly, my attention where it needed to be. And, um, I did that. Started, oh, I went to my husband. I'm like, hey, are you okay with this? And he said, that's amazing. I want it too. And I went, oh, well, hold on. Well, we, didn't, we didn't discuss that part. That was not in the plan. <laughs> and so I was like, oh boy. Okay, great. He's come, you know, he really hadn't participated much in the real estate up until that point, other than really supporting me. And I, and I was like, okay, great. Now, now we don't need 30 properties. We need 80 to get him out of his job. Not happening not happening. Um, I just couldn't even imagine like going through like a hundred or like a hundred more loans. Cause I was using hard money loans, like <laughs> double closes, all that. I was like, you know what, we need to find a, a bigger way or, or a simpler way to go through this. And that meant we had to do bigger deals and scale and get more units with each transaction. And so we let, let us down two paths simultaneously, the active side, as well as the passive side. And when I went into the active side of real estate, I realized I had a lot of translatable skills. What I didn't have was the knowledge, expertise, and team in the credit and lending. Like, like I had to rework all of that. I did my market work. If my market didn't work, now I'm back to building all new brokers. Um, I had my same lender that I was using for my conventional properties no longer worked for my multifamily properties that I was trying to acquire. I now needed to develop partnerships to bring in, you know, people on these larger deals because I didn't have like a cool, like one or 2 million laying around just to access some of the smaller deals. And so, um, you know, really just trying to put together all those puzzle pieces. And then that's when I stumbled across passive investing. I'm like, wow, I can actually invest in a deal with somebody who's and a known operator, a strong operator that already has all these puzzle pieces already figured out. And I am the limited partner bringing the capital to, to the investment in order to close on it. Now, I decided to go down both roads simultaneously and really, you know, dive in head first. But, you know, for some people, they're just like, they hit the roadblock and they have to re-engineer everything. There is a way to still access those larger deals that doesn't require you to get a PhD in multifamily real estate or commercial real estate. Yeah, I, I love it. And what, that's very important that you saw some of the skills that you gained in that did translate over, but you needed to kind of mold into that that new environment. And it's like, a lot of people are concerned me because they're so ready to quit their job, right? When they're when they're getting their real estate, but if you quit your job, you don't you don't have, you're not bankable. You know, it's like, we're all so quick to the financial freedom, but like, make sure that, cause that's going to be a lot harder, right? As an entrepreneur, you're talking to one, you know? And so like, you have to learn these kind of concepts of like money and lenders and hard money and and, and stuff like that, hundred percent. Yeah. I think for somebody, I'm not the burn the boats type person. Mm -hmm. I'm a ready fire aim type person. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll definitely, mm -hmm. you know, you give me just enough information, I'm all in and I'll yeah. build a parachute on the way down. I, yeah. I'll do that. Um, but, you know, as far as burn the boats, um, I'm very calculated in that. And, you know, I work with, you know, several, you know, coaching clients to help them initially get into, you know, building their initial portfolio, you know, one to 20 units. Mm -hmm. And that's oftentimes they're, they're coming from a place of fear They are, 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 are pain. I should say they're trying to get away from something. They want to get away from their job, right? Because they want to, you know, have one of these freedoms in life. However, initially that, that first job, that job that you have is like your golden ticket until you hit, you know, 10 units as an individual investor or 20 units. You know, if you have a spouse, that is your mm -hmm. golden ticket to lock in some of the best loans and, and debt that we have available. Now, I know everybody's saying interest rates are going up. They were, 
I mean, guys, the interest rates are what they were when I was building my portfolio in 2000, you know, you know, 17, 18, 19, like whatever those years were. Right. So it's, um, but the, the debt right now, the money is in the debt, you know, being Mm -hmm. able to, you know, lock in those expenses for 30 years. Um, that, Mm -hmm. that's a beautiful, beautiful thing to do. I love it. When, what was the first active, like big deal that you did outside of like the single families or the flipping? What was the first one that you got into? I actually was a joint venture in a 52 unit apartment building in Indianapolis, right outside in Indianapolis. Did you find the deal or did they find you? No, I I, uh, was brought in, um, you know, uh, later in the deal um, to help like bring in capital on the deal. Uh, anyways, but that was, that was years ago. That was like the first deal. And, you know, there were so many things we broke even on the deal. We made a little bit of money. Um, there were so many things, a key thing there was property management. Um, you know, we had, um, we had a couple glitches with people that, uh, one of the, um, ladies that was helping lease up the properties. Anyways, um, we discovered the, the, the issue a little late in the process, but again, that's one of the, that's why being with a professional team is so important. I think it, those are puzzle pieces that anybody can feel, figure out, but you got to have your eye on the ball, right? You're, you're taking mm-hmm. your time and attention away from what you might be wanting to run to over here and focusing on, on you're building a business if you're going to mm-hmm. do it actively. When you're looking for a deal from a passive aspect and you're investing in a syndicator or somebody that put the deal together, whether it be a car wash or whatever, what are you looking for in that person that signals to you? Like, obviously the numbers have to work on the deal, but what are you looking for? Cause I'm sure you've seen many of the inside of deals and, and teams. What is it that mm-hmm. you're pinpointing when you know that you're going to invest with that person? Well, and again, to back it up a couple of steps, right? We already talked about the first thing. You Mm -hmm. have to believe in real estate. Mm -hmm. The second thing is you have to understand what your goals are. What do you Mm -hmm. need from your Mm -hmm. portfolio? Do Mm -hmm. you need cash flow? Do you need appreciation? Do you need tax benefits, diversification? Um, What is it you need? Now, the reason why I kind of drive home that point is because uh, I've seen people get themselves into deals and working with operators, right? When, in, those syndicated deals are illiquid, just like buying your own single family properties, probably for mm-hmm. five to seven years. And um, if it's the wrong type of strategy for your portfolio, you should never be in the deal. So you have to understand what it is you need for your portfolio and for your goals. And once you have identified that, then it's time to go look for the operators that are executing on strategies that would help you meet those goals. I know a lot of people like love jumping on lists and they, they get, they look at deals and everything looks great. And I have talked to many investors that have done this. They get, get the deal. They like, I want to go in on this deal. Now it's the time to call the operator. No, we got to think about it differently because in a passive deal, the operator is the deal. Okay. The deal comes, you know, the actual apartment building and car wash or self-storage unit, whatever it happens to be is secondary to what the operator is, uh, what they bring to the table. So, you know, when we're looking at the operator, you know, they have to have a, for me, they have to have a background in uh, business, strong background in business, definitely real estate. Um, Somebody has to have a really strong background in real estate on their team and a track record there. What have they done? How many, Deals have they gone into? How many have they refinanced or done supplemental loans on? How many have they exited? What is the performance of those exits compared to what they initially underwritten? Is there only one operator or are there, are there multiple operators? I want to, you know, I don't want to be with a one operator because what happens if they win the lottery and they don't need me anymore? <laughs> or like mm-hmm. they get hit by a bus, mm-hmm. you know, what happens to the business then? Um, you know, are they doing this full time? Those are some things that are kind of key red flags for me. Um, Cause I want somebody watching my money as it's their job. That's what they're there to do. And they're watching their money as if it's my money. Um, and then, you know, just, you know, getting into the, the no like, and trust factor. Do you understand what, what they're doing, you know, what kind of strategies they're executing what kind of class of deals are they going into? What is the business plan? You know, how much development risk is in the business plan? And those are all things you can kind of glean from that initial conversation with an operator. But again, they are, that is the critical step. That's where people make money and lose money is in that step. And what's the fourth aspect? You said there was just, that was one, two, three. What's you said the five pillars, right? 
Oh, the five. Oh, the four. Well, there's four, four wealth four, pillars. Four wealth pillars. Part of okay, so yeah. I'll recap those. So capital preservation. Warren Buffett's rule number one, don't lose money. Rule number two, see rule number one, right? So wealth pillar. So capital preservation. Second wealth pillar is cash flow. Um, does the asset cash flow? Now, the cash flow is kind of hard to get in, right now in today's you know, environment mm-hmm. because asset prices, I don't care if you're buying a single family property or a multi-family property. Asset prices have gone up you know, really quickly in comparison to the income that you can produce on the property. So, you know, you may not be getting that 1%, you know, yield per month that you were looking for. You know, maybe you're getting 0.5 to 0.6, 0.7. Um, but does it cash flow somewhat? Because it tells me it's stable in today's environment. Um, two, it, it, when I'll get to the, you know, the, the next wealth pillar, which is equity build. Because I want to have at least one, if not three pillars of the equity build. Um, Is there a plan to raise the property to market rents? Is there a plan to decrease the expenses on the property? And especially in commercial real estate, is there a plan to add additional streams of income to the property? Now, those are what I call the NOI levers. You know, I want to see one, if not all three of those levers being pulled. There's other ways to add equity to the property, right? We get natural market appreciation, okay? We see that a lot of times in single family property. Um, We also can have the tenant pay down the loan for us. That can also create equity for us. Um, In commercial real estate, we generally don't see that happen because properties change hands probably once every three to seven years. So it's really not worth it to actually put in a whole lot of time and effort on getting the tenant to pay down the loan for you. Um, that's how lenders make a lot of money on single family investors that sell their properties all the time. They make it, they make it, they make their money on that, you know, betting on us selling the property in five to seven years. Um, so that's three. And then the fourth wealth pillar was tax benefits. How can you go into um, any investment you know, particularly applies to business and real estate transactions, that any investment where you're getting some sort of depreciation and some sort of like kind exchange and that like kind exchange in real estate is called a 1031 exchange. Mm -hmm. Now there's two other kind of bonuses here that I really like to look for. Um, Is the, does the property have leverage on it, right? Are we able to, you know, get good leverage to boost returns? Now in today's environment, um, there's an interest rate risk. Right. So I want to see some sort of block on that interest rate for at least the term in the business plan. Um, So, you know, the business plan five to seven years, I want to see an interest rate lock or at least the ability to lock and extend or put some sort of ceiling on it, you know, for that the business rate or the business timeline. That's why on the single family side, a lot of investors love the 30 year fixed loan because they're locking their expenses for 30 years. And then the other bonus is kind of an inflation hedge is are you able to pass along expenses, those expense increases to the tenant on the property or whoever's paying the rent? Um, So that is also another way to kind of make money. Because when you do that, you can erode away the debt on the property. Um, You're actually paying, you know, fast forward 10 years from now, that debt, you know, is cheaper than when it was the day you bought it. Mm -hmm. No, it's so good. Yeah. Covering all those aspects as you've grown, you know, my big thing is mindset as you've grown, like, you know, obviously you're very driven that goes without saying, but you know, did, did you like, how did you stay so focused on what you needed to do and how did you keep growing? Cause I mean, you went from, you know, doing a couple properties to doing massive deals and with a ton of money. Um, is that something that you cultivated over the time or, is it just like the environment that you surrounded yourself in when deals were getting bigger and bigger, you were comfortable with your team that you had? Um, so gosh, a lot, a lot of things there. Um, one, I didn't know what I didn't know, right? Like, <laughs> um, when I first got into real estate, I had, I, you know, if I fast forwarded, you know, that's 2002, it's 20 years later. Um, I had no idea that I would be here. I mean, you asked me in my 20 year, you know, myself 20 years ago, I thought I would be still in public health or medical field. (laughs) This was not even on my radar. So um, the kind of drive home point to that is um, as you get into real estate 
or any sort of adventure that you know that you know and love, you have to be able to unhook your identity to who you were, right? So for me, I had to be able to let go of the fact that, you know, a couple of different things. I had to be able to let go that I'm not a medical professional anymore. I'm not in public health professional anymore. Uh, I don't need to be a public health professional. That doesn't drive my identity in order for me to have the life that I love and desire. Um, two, I also had to kind of like, you know, quiet, like those gremlins in my life, those people, the naysayers that told me that, you know, what are you doing? Or, you know, questioned me. Um, that's hard, you know, especially, I feel it's harder for women. Um, just, you know, you know, from a generalization standpoint, you know, um, you know, we just are a little bit driven to be, um, more conscious of, you know, being, you know, we want to be accepted by everybody around us. Right. Um, but I had to like, I had to get over that. I had to get over what my family thought about me doing real estate. Um, and then like from the actual execution side, uh, I had to level up and surround myself with people that were doing bigger and better things than I was. Um, and at each stage, right. It, if I had taken myself 20 years ago and tried to surround myself with the people that I am, I'm surrounded with, with now, I don't think that would have worked, right? I, there were several iterations of myself along the way. And I, uh, every single time I, when I, you know, resonated with the next big project, I would surround myself with the people that were actually doing those things. And, you know, it just helps kind of like lift all boats. Um, and then, uh, their book, one of my favorite books is called the one thing by Gary Keller and Jay Papasan. And that just helps you for me, that book really helped me um, identify what my values were in my life, what it is that I wanted um, and what kind of life I wanted to create for myself and my family and keep, um, it's a time management book, but it's priority management, you know, making sure all my actions were driven to those priorities. Mm, I love that. One of the things that is interesting to me is that we've made, you know, active income when it comes to investing, we've made it really cool and everybody's excited. And like, you know, one of the things I hope that we can bring back is why I'm very interested in your kind of teaching. I'm hoping that we can get people to understand like passive income is really cool too. Like, you know, like I, I hope it doesn't get a bad rap as it used to get. Like, uh, like for me personally, just from a, like I have tons of businesses and, and jobs and I travel a bunch. So like for me, I'm going to take my network and invest in other people doing the deal because why would I spend my whole life trying to become a syndicator when I know all the best, you know, the best of ones in the country. Right. And that's kind of, why would I do that? If they know how to buy and sell businesses, I'm just going to invest in those things. And so is that kind of what you're teaching your, 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 your things? It's like, Hey, you can still be a high powered whatever you are. You don't have to go from a high powered attorney to flipping houses. You know, like I try to tell my buddies all the time, like you can invest in other people and still make your great money over here. Is that kind of what you're seeing in the passive income space is like, maybe it's kind of coming back a little bit. Like people are getting more inclined. There's more vehicles these days. Yeah. So I think that, you know, I, I really resonate with what you're saying there because, um, you know, there, there, there's kind of a, you know, there's a point where you don't want to do it yourself anymore. Right. Yeah. And, and, you know, maybe you bought the, your first like three or four properties and then you're just like, man, I really want to go on that vacation in Europe and I don't want to be on call all the time. I'm going to put them in property management. Right. Um, now you moved yourself from self-employed and kind of had you over to the business quadrant. And then at some point in time, you're just like, I don't want even want to like manage the managers anymore. I want to just like go, I, I know enough about real estate. I want to go into somebody else's business and have them be the expert. Or maybe you want to diversify. Like, you know, for me with single family properties, I will probably always buy those myself. I will probably not go into any sort of fund that has that as an element of its fund. But was I going to be the expert on self-storage? Was I going to be the expert on car washes? No, I found the experts on them in, you know, in those spaces and chose to invest with them. They can do it better than I can, right? They have the knowledge, they have the expertise, they have the team, they have the network, they have the credit and lending, they can pull other investor money together. And guess what I get to do? I get to buy their time. I get to leverage their time to get a cut of the deal. Everybody, you know, you know, profits in these type of deals or can profit in these type of deals. Um, 
And yeah, I mean, could you do it yourself and make more money? Absolutely. But what does it cost you? Mm. Okay. For one, there's an opportunity cost. Are you actually ever going to do it? Number two, um, is there, you know, what kind of does it, what, what kind of lifestyle does it cost you? What kind of time, um, freedom does it cost you? Um, what kind of choice freedom does it cost you to be able to do that? And when I go into passive investing, passive investments, I get all that back. Um, Mm -hmm. there, you know, kind of like a, you know, quick story to tell, we just, uh, did a big spring break with my family in California and, um, I was able to, I felt like I was going to, I had everything set up. I thought I was going to be able to check out for like 10 days. And, um, my property manager, you know, called me on like multiple things. He knew I was out of town. He knew I was on spring break, but all these things, you know, issues kept coming down the pipeline that I had to deal with the single family properties. Okay. I only, you know, at this point in time, I only have like 15. Then on the same side, I have over 50 passive investments. I heard from one operator and it was like, hey, we're selling the properties. You're making a lot of money. Do you want to do a 1031 exchange? And I, you know what I had to do? It took me 30 seconds to reply, yes. Thank <laughs> Whereas you. Whereas a Friday morning, like we're driving. Oh, apologies there. Friday morning, we're driving and I'm on the phone, like wrestling with Home Depot going, where's the washer and dryer for the tenant that I purchased six weeks ago, right? Yeah. No, it's, I, I remember it like it was yesterday. I was in here, I was in Arizona with one of my mentors who flips like 15 houses at the same time. He runs like four businesses. We're sitting in the house. He looks at me, he goes, hey man, this ain't you. He's like, let it go. He's like, your people, your business is people. Do that leave it up to somebody else. And it was like, it's like he gave, and I swear to God, I remember this like it was yesterday. It's like he gave me permission to not go down the path that everybody else had gone down. And it like freed me up, man. It was just like, like, it was like awesome because I was going down that path, but I had bought three single families and I was just like, you know, like, okay. And now we're buying businesses, right? Which is way more exciting to me. That's people or different layers, you know? And so like, it really takes that self expression you know, like understanding that you have to passive income, do this, everything. And you tell that story, like, I'm going to share that story the rest of my life. Like I got one call, we're in 50 deals and it was, Hey, we're selling, you're going to make money. Like that's, that's the dream call. (laughs) (laughs) I'm like, I want, how many more of those calls can I get? That's what I want. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. If people want to find out more about your teachings and the stuff that you're doing, how would they do that? Yeah, you can find me at PassiveInvestingWithWhitney.com. And there I've got some free goodies for people, um, a checklist on how to get into passive investing. Uh, You can also hop on the phone with me and we can talk about our open deals that we have at PassiveInvesting.com. And, you know, just talk about real estate in general, Uh, especially if you're ready as uh, one of my investors I was talking to a couple of weeks ago. He's like, I'm ready to fire Home Depot and Lowe's. I'm like, yes, come talk to me. (laughs) The last... The property that we did two years ago, I think I did, I think I counted, I think it was 65 runs to Home Depot and 50 runs to the dump. And I was like, okay, this is, uh, I'm, this is not good. So yes, reach out to her and learn passive income. Trust me, it might be the vehicle that you're looking for, uh, especially when you don't have to go out and search for yourself and be the boots in the, in the Home Depots, unless you just really love Home Depot for your dates with your significant other. Uh, you know, like my, I love my brother-in-law. Like, he's like, come save me. He's like, I'm, si-, he's like, I'm sitting in the Home Depot parking lot for the fifth time this week. And I'm, I'm really over it. He's like a dentist, you know, he's like, and I'm really over it too. Why am I doing this again? Please remind me why I'm doing this. And I was like, yeah, passive income, baby. All right, guys, if you got some value from this episode, send it to a friend, share it with somebody who gets some value and we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to Construct Your Life with Austin Lenny. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to rate, review, subscribe, and pay it forward by sharing with a friend. Most importantly, take this opportunity to start constructing your life by taking immediate action on what you learned. For show notes, resources, and more information on one-on-one coaching with Austin, visit constructyourlifepodcast.com.